Welcome to South Point Church Online. We want to say hi to those of you watching in our local Southern Maryland community. We also want to welcome those of you who might be watching in different parts of the country and maybe even different parts of the world. Uh, My name is Matt. I'm part of the team here at South Point, and we're so glad that you chose to be with us this Sunday. Hey, we're in week three of a series called Silent Church, Conversations Not Had on Sunday. Uh, This Sunday, we're going to be addressing sexuality, especially as it relates to same gender attraction and transgender, right? And so I just want to make sure that if you have kids around, I understand that everyone has a different kind of age that they have those conversations. So just wanted to make you aware of that so that you could kind of navigate that at your discretion. Hey, I'd like to be totally honest with you this morning. Usually I'm fired up and ready to go to give messages. Uh, Today's message is one message that I would, I'd actually like to avoid and not give. And uh, the reason that I'd like to avoid it or not give it is that when it comes to same gender attraction and transgender issues, like I'm, I'm just not an expert. I don't have all the answers. And on top of not having all the answers, um, like there's going to be questions that I won't be able to answer today. There'll be issues that I won't be able to get to in a one message thing, right? I won't be able to say everything perfectly today. There'll be some things that I probably uh, just get wrong. Emotions run high. Um, Sometimes it's the emotion of fear. Sometimes it's the emotion of hurt. Sometimes it's the emotion of anger. Um, And so I know that today, by the time we get to the end, there'll probably still be some tension. And then in some part, I will fail. And so um, you might be asking, Matt, if you know that you're going to fail in some part, why are you even going to tackle that? And that's a great question. And the answer to that question is why I'm willing to to have this conversation uh, this morning. And I want to put it up on the screen for us this today, and it's this. The number one perception of Christians, think about that, the number one perception of Christians by outsiders is that we're against people in the LGBT community. I mean, I want you to let that sink in for a moment. The number one perception of those outside the church is that Christians are against people who have same gender attraction or transgender, anyone in the LGBT community. I mean, let that sink in, right? The first and the highest impression of Christians isn't our love. It isn't our compassion. It isn't our integrity. Their first impression um, isn't our friendliness. It isn't our radical generosity. No, the number one impression people have of followers of Jesus is that we are against a group of people. And if we're really honest, do we think that's why Jesus left heaven? He came down here and he lived and he taught. He was crucified on a cross and he was buried and he conquered hell and death. I don't believe Jesus did all those things so that people could see as their number one perception, Christians are against people. And it leads us to a truth that we all know in this morning. And it's this, is how followers of Jesus treat people. See, whenever we talk about an issue and we kind of talk about it, people want to talk about it like it's out there. But whenever we talk about real life issues, right, it's people. There are real people made in the image of God. People in the LGBT community significantly impacts outsiders' view of Jesus. And so the reason that I'm willing to fail in part today is because I believe in the reputation of Jesus. I want to create change around that. And so I specifically want to start off this morning by saying something. I believe that we, the church, need to be better and that we, the church, can be better. I want to look my friends who are gay. I want to look my friends who are transgender in the eye this morning. And I want to apologize for how some Christians have treated you. I want to say that all people are made in the image of of God. And matter of fact, that's core value number two at South Point, right? Everyone is loved and welcome. That all people, um, because they're made in the image of God, are worthy of dignity and respect. And it leads us to a question that we need to answer today, right? The question we need to answer is, how do we, how do you, how do I, how do we engage our friends in the LGBTQ community? How do we do that? How do we do it where we don't swing to the extreme, where we kind of ignore the instructions of Jesus, right? Like, we all know this truth that I'm going to put up on the screen for us this morning, right? And it's this. Love without boundaries 
isn't love, right? Like the reason God gives us boundaries and instructions and commands is because he loves us. And we also don't want to swing to the other extreme where we ignore Jesus's mission. And it would go something like this. Boundaries without love is legalism. I mean, we're reminded of John 3, 16, right? Everyone remembers that verse and knows that verse, for God so loved the world. But right after that, in John 3, 17, Jesus says this about himself. He says, for the Son of Man did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. And so as we address this issue of how do we engage our friends who have same gender attraction or transgender, how, how do we engage um, that community in a way that isn't compromising, in a way that isn't condemning? Is it possible that there is another way? And that's where there's great news for you and I and us this morning, is that there is a third way that Jesus models. At South Point, we call that the messy middle. And it sounds cool, but I want you to know, the messy middle, well, it's really unpopular. And the reason the messy middle is really unpopular is because those who tend to swing towards the compromise side say it's never enough. And being in the messy middle is unpopular because those who swing to the condemning side say that we never do enough. And it's interesting, we believe at South Point that Jesus lived in the messy middle. And I wonder if Jesus living in the messy middle is what caused the religious leaders of his day to want to kill him by crucifying him. And that might be a message for a different day. But what I'd like to do is look at how Jesus taught us that we don't have to compromise or condemn, that there's actually a third option that you and that I and that we can choose. It's an option that Jesus modeled for us. Matter of fact, we pick it up in the eyewitness account of the Gospel of Luke, right? Now, Jesus is coming into town, and whenever Jesus showed up in a town, there, there were always crowds of people, and there was this guy in the crowd, his, his name was Zacchaeus, and he wanted to see Jesus. He had heard about Jesus, but he wanted to see Jesus for himself. And so, I just wanna stop right there and go, I believe there are tons of people outside the walls of the church who wanna see Jesus for who he truly is. So he wanted to take a look at who Jesus was. And so it says, because of the crowd, he ran up to this fig tree to get a look at Jesus. And this is where we're going to pick up how Jesus responds without compromise or condemning. And we pick it up and it says, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Now, when you read that and when I read that, and when we read that in our American 21st century lens, like that just seems normal. Jesus is a good guy. He sees a guy wanting to see him and he invites himself over for barbecue, right? There's nothing really odd or offensive about that, right? Other than maybe Jesus invited himself to the guy's house, right? But that's not really how that was taken in Jesus's day. And here's why. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. Matter of fact, there wasn't a worse label that you could give another human being in the first century than chief tax collectors. I mean, the Romans hated uh, the tax collectors because they were traitors to their own country. And uh, the Jewish people hated tax collectors because they were traitors. And, and they kind of uh, took off the top for their own wealth. I mean, there wasn't almost a worse label that you could give anyone other than than a tax collector. As a matter of fact, this just isn't my dear opinion. We see this in the eyewitness account a little bit later. We see everyone's response to Jesus saying to Zacchaeus, I wanna be with you. I wanna spend some time. I wanna get to know you, right? We think, ah, oh, that's what Jesus wants to do with all people, right? Get to know them, spend time, right? But it says all. It wasn't just the crowd, it was those closest to Jesus. It was the 12 disciples, it was, it was the followers, and it was the crowd. All the people saw this and they began to mutter. I mean, they were like, hey man, like Jesus, we don't care who you hang out with, but like chief tax collectors, like, no, that's, that's not good. He has gone to be the guest of the sinner. And isn't this true? Isn't this what humanity does? Despite the century, despite the culture, we as people will always put labels on other people. And sometimes we'll put labels on people to go, God wouldn't want to hang out with those people. God doesn't love those people. And that was the label that they had put on Zacchaeus, that, that surely, surely if Jesus was a godly leader, surely if Jesus was the Messiah, God wouldn't love and want to hang out and befriend someone like Zacchaeus. And yet Jesus showed up to show us that God is for all people, 
that he loves all people. That when Jesus died on the cross, he died for all people. Zacchaeus' response to Jesus was one of humility and grace. And we see as, as Jesus responds to this, he kind of closes with something that is, is so powerful and impactful. And we're going to put it up on the screen. It's this. And he said to him, Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. You see, whether he was a chief tax collector or not, he too belonged to the family of God. You see, regardless of the labels that we put on people, regardless of the labels that we put on culturally, regardless of the labels we put on each other politically, regardless of the labels we put on each other sexually, they matter deeply to God too. All people are made in the image of God and they matter to Jesus. And so in this, we see Jesus do something that isn't condemning, it isn't compromising, it's something radically different. He steps into relationship. And what I love about Jesus is when Jesus steps into relationship, he never does it because of the response of the other person. He always does that because of that's God's character. It's who he is. And so there are three quick things that we can take away from how Jesus engages Zacchaeus. And I want to put them up because I think they can speak to our heart as followers of Jesus. How do we engage people who have same gender attraction, who experience transgender? Like, how, how do we do this? And so the first principle from the scripture that we can take away is this, is Jesus came to, and you can type that word in, he came to what? Reconcile people to God, not to condemn them. Like, I just, can we just be honest here? Um, from, from one follow of Jesus to another, it seems like Christians want to judge people and then let God love them. Where actually God calls us to actually do the opposite, right? God calls us to love people and it's God's job to judge people. I love that when Jesus came, the worst thing that the religious leaders could say, right? When they were trying to make fun of Jesus, the worst thing that they could throw at Jesus is that he was a friend to the sinners and to the tax collectors. I mean, figure that out. I mean, there was a sinner bracket and then there was a tax collector bracket. The worst thing that you could throw at him, right? And so Jesus came to reconcile people to God, not to condemn them. And I think as followers of Jesus, our job is not to roast people. Our job is not to judge people. Our job is not to condemn people. Our job is to love them and try to reconcile them to God. That is what we're supposed to do. Here's the second thing we see, is that Jesus stepped into the uncomfortable perception because people matter. And this is what I love about Jesus. Despite what people thought of Zacchaeus, and despite what people would think of Jesus for hanging out with Zacchaeus, Jesus was not concerned about people's perceptions. He was more concerned about Zacchaeus and that person. And isn't it true when it comes to this issue of same gender attraction or transgender or any issue that addresses the LGBT community, that sometimes I think in churches, we're so worried about what other people will think about us that we're we're not willing to be uncomfortable and to step into something that we maybe don't know, something maybe we don't understand, to get to know and to love someone different than us. But Jesus was willing to step into the uncomfortable perception because people mattered. He died on the cross for all people. And wouldn't it be great? I mean, wouldn't it be awesome if the church had the reputation that they were being willing to be uncomfortable, to step in and build relationships with all kinds of people, because all people matter deeply to God. And here's what I love. And here's kind of the part that I want to talk about. And the third observation is this. Jesus didn't compromise and Jesus didn't condemn he created space for relationship. I mean, Jesus didn't look at Zacchaeus and said, hey man, you've been robbing your own people. Jesus didn't say, hey, you are a traitor. Jesus didn't address anything about Zacchaeus being a tax collector. Jesus didn't address the label other people had given Zacchaeus. All Jesus did was address the truth that God wants to be in a relation, not a religion, but a personal relationship. Zacchaeus, come down. I must be with you today. Jesus used the word immediately, that he wants to know and to be with him and to be his friend. And that relationship creates heart change that nothing else can do. And so Jesus didn't compromise. He didn't condemn. What he did 
was create space. And I believe as followers of Jesus at church, that's the messy middle, that we create space for relationship. And what does this messy middle look like? I mean, what does this practically look like in everyday life? Listen, as you go on, as you and I go out to work, to the gym, uh, in our limited capacity, right? Uh, as we're on Facebook, as we're on social media, like how do we engage people who have same gender attraction or transgender or any issue in the LGBT community? How do we actually practically do that? How do we create space instead of compromising or condemning? How do we create space for Jesus to show up in those relationships? And so I want to say the messy middle boils down to two words. Like, I just want to be so simple today that when you walk away, you'll be able to go, uh, I don't remember all that Pastor Matt said. I do remember he talked about sacred and he talked about surrender. But the messy middle lives with those two words, that there is sacredness and there is surrender. And so the first thing that I want to talk about of living in the messy middle and a practical le uh, level is sacred. And it's this truth. Everyone is an image bearer. Everyone is an image bearer. Here's the reality. Regardless of what labels that you put on people, regardless of the labels that I put on people, regardless of the labels that we put on each other, the reality is, is all human beings are made in the image of God. Jesus died for everyone. Not everyone will receive him. Not everyone will love him back. Not everyone will say yes to Jesus. I understand that. But in the end, Jesus came for all people, right? And so all people are created in the image of God. And there is a sacredness that we should assign to all people regardless of the labels that we put on people. And here's the thing, like, I'm wearing a church that says everything changes when it's someone you know. And if we're really honest, some of you might live in circles where you don't have a gay friend. You don't have a friend who has same gender attraction. Maybe you've never actually been a friend to someone who's transgender. Maybe your circle, maybe uh, the percentages just play the part that you actually aren't friends. Maybe you have an acquaintance, maybe you have a relative, maybe you know of someone, but you actually don't have a relationship. And so today, I want to give us a couple of key things to remind us of the sacredness of those in the LGBT community today. And so, like some of these things are going to be tough. Some of them you may not agree with. But I ask that you wouldn't mentally or physically check out, just like every week when you hear something that you might not like and you might not agree with. And here's the first sacredness I want to give to my friends who are gay or transgender. And this is really important for you to hear. The overwhelming majority of people who are gay or transgender would not and do not choose that. Like, I'm just going to let it hang there. Because here's what I hear many Christians say. Oh, they just choose that. They, they just, they just want to be that way. And if you've actually ever been a friend, like a long-term friend of someone who has same gender attraction or transgender, you would know that if they could, if there was a switch that they could flip, they most of the time would, would, would absolutely change whatever it is that they are going through. Now, there are some people that choose to be gay, and there are some people that choose to change their gender, but the overwhelming majority feel like they are born that way. And one of the privileges that I've had of living in a community for almost two and a half decades and doing ministry with people for over three decades, most of them since they were in middle school or high school, I've got to walk alongside some people from when they were young all the way till they're adults um, in, their, in their 30s. Like that's, that's how old I am, right? And I just wanna give you two examples. Like I have some friends who are gay. And I've known them since they were in elementary school. And I've watched them grow up in a, in a two-parent household um, with going to church every Sunday where they, they never experienced sexual trauma. Like they grew, grew up in an all-American home with a mom and a dad and they went to church. And, I, and as I talked to them and I walked them through and their same gender attraction, they would go, I feel like I was born this way. And since I have known them personally since they were in elementary or middle school, I can go, man, I can see how that's played out. I've had other conversations with people who share their story and say, I was molested at four and it went from four years old till I was a teenager. 
And so this morning, we can give the sacredness that there are people, overwhelming majority of people, do not choose this. They feel like they were born this way. And when we ask that question of, well, why does that happen? I want to say this morning, I don't have all the answers. To be honest with you, the reading I've done on the research is very inconclusive. What we do know is the answer to why people have same gender attraction or transgender, right? There's no simple um, or single reason to do that. And I want to gently ask my friends that that don't have friends um, that are gay, that don't have friends that are transgender, could we please stop dehumanizing our fellow people that are made in the image of God? When we make statements like, well, just pray it away, or just like decide not to do that, or like just make a decision, I go, if you haven't talked to them, if you haven't walked a mile in their shoes, if you haven't had conversation, if you haven't heard their stories, if you don't realize that there's a spectrum of reasons and situations why people may fall into the LGBT community, then what you're doing is you're dehumanizing their story and their sacredness. Another request that I would have to keep people who are gay or transgender to keep the sacredness that they are image bearers. I can't tell you uh, for whatever reason, um, either politically or a religiosity, that we affirm that people um, who have a different orientation or who have some gender identity or change their gender identity, right, that somehow they're more immoral. And I don't know why that's true. Maybe it's because of fear. Maybe it's for religious propaganda or a political posture. But listen, can we stop fear, creating fear in people and saying, well, if someone has same gender attraction, they're a predator. Can we stop saying if someone has is, is transgender that they're more immoral? I can tell you from having personal relationships with friends who are both transgender and gay that some of my gay friends and my transgender friends are some of the most moral people filled with integrity, kind, honest, would never harm someone, are, are, are not immoral in any way. And when we as followers of Jesus, because of fear, and, and, and to assign something that may not belong to someone because of their orientation or because they are transgender is not only immoral, it's wrong. And so we need to create sacredness and go, we need to judge them by the content of their character, not their orientation or their gender. And the last thing I want to say is when it comes to my friends who are gay or transgender, their sacredness is that no one, no one is excluded from the grace found in Jesus. One of the hard things is when I talk about the bustedness and brokenness of the world, many of my friends, transgender or gay or those in the LGBT community will always ask me, Matt, do you think I'm broken? And the answer is yes. And then they get mad at me and I go, wait a second. I don't think you're broken or busted because you are because you're uh, gay or because you're transgender. I think we are busted and broken because it's a human issue. Brokenness and bustedness isn't an LGBTQ issue. It is a human issue. And all of us have access to Jesus. No one is excluded from the grace found in Jesus. There is nothing that the blood of Jesus can't do. That you and I don't get to heaven because of how good we are, our actions, our orientation, our gender. There is only, I mean, that is the gospel, right? Is that we get to heaven, we get to be in a relationship with God because of the finished work that Jesus did on the cross. No one is excluded. So the messy middle means this, that that our gay friends and our transgender friends, they are sacred. They are made in the image of God. They are not second-class citizens. There is no glass ceiling or second class in the church that gay and transgender people can absolutely be deeply spiritual. Matter of fact, I found this to be so true, deeply spiritual and love God and Jesus. And so we need to affirm the sacredness of our fellow human beings. And so the messy middle is, is that people, Everyone is an image bearer. And the other side of the messy middle is the word surrender. So again, if you walk away, these are the two words, sacred and surrender. And the second word is surrender, and it's this. Surrendering our sexuality to Jesus is a part of being a disciple for, and you can just type this in, everyone, right? Surrendering our sexuality to Jesus is a part of being a disciple for everyone. 
So I don't care whether you're straight, I don't care whether you're gay, I don't care whether you're transgender. At the end of the day, if we are followers of Jesus, right? If we said yes to Jesus, and being a Christian is, doesn't cost us a thing, but when we are a follower of Jesus, it's costly. When we follow Jesus, regardless of our orientation, regardless of our gender, we surrender our sexuality to Jesus. And here's the thing that I have to say when it comes to the surrender. And I've been trying to say this for three weeks. At the end of the day, you, me, we, we are more than our sexuality. Yes, our sexuality is a part, but you and me and we are more than the sum of our attractions and our desires, right? And this is true, especially when we say yes to Jesus. When we say yes to Jesus and become his follower, then we are not our culture, we are not our political party, and we are not our sexuality. The thing that goes in front of every label that should be put on us is Christ follower, right? Like part of this living the messy middle is we're all sacred, right? We're all image bearers, right? Regardless of our orientation, regardless of our gender, right? But the flip side of that is that if we are followers of Jesus, that we surrender our sexuality to Jesus, right? And then this, is, this becomes really hard because I understand that if I have a thousand people on the other side of this camera today watching this, that there's not a consensus on what surrendered sexuality looks in same gender attraction, right? Like there's, there's just not consensus um, in that issue. But there needs to be an addressing of, it's not what we want, but what does Jesus instruct us to do? How do we surrender our sexuality to God? And I just believe, number one, that that is the thing that we have to hold on. It's not what we want, not what the world tells us, but what does Jesus call us to? And that all of us, like I said, whether you're straight, whether you're gay, or whether you're transgender, that all of us have to surrender our sexuality to Jesus if we're disciples. And so, uh, like I said in the sacred part, there are no second-class people in the church, and that like getting baptized and being able to be a part of the church, you're not discluded because you're gay or transgender. And the flip side of that is when we talk about surrender, as, as I look at the Bible, again, I just need to tell you, and, I, and clarity makes for friendships. I was, I've had several conversations with gay friends this week to make sure that I communicated in a loving and a fair way, right? Um, and one of my friends says, Matt, what you just need to do is be clear so that you don't create harm. And, and as I study the scriptures and as I look at the Bible, as I look at the life of Jesus, I don't believe that same gender sex is God's will or God's plan. So can you be gay and transgender and love Jesus and be a part of the church and serve and be fully engaged and be a Christian and go to heaven? Absolutely, 100%. But I do believe that all of us, including my friends in the LGBT community, that we should surrender our sexuality to Jesus. And we don't believe that same uh, gender sex is God's plan or his will for our lives. It's the messy middle. At some point, Everyone that I've spoken today is gonna to hear something that they don't wanna hear. You're probably gonna have heard something that you disagree and you might not like me. And at the end of the day, that's okay. I want us to live and that people are sacred. And I want us to live in the truth that we're supposed to surrender ourselves to Jesus. That's what it means to follow him. And so I would say it this way and I'm gonna put it up on the screen and it's this. No one is disqualified from God's love or dignity because of orientation or gender. I think we as the church need to come out and say that it is not your orientation or your gender that will disqualify you from the love and the dignity that you deserve as an image bearer. And that just because you may have same gender attraction or you may be transgender doesn't mean that you don't love God and you're not pursuing Jesus, right? And at the end of the day, I love what Jesus said about Zacchaeus. He says, for he too, he too, God loves gay people. God loves transgender people. And because God loves gay and transgender people, we followers of Jesus should love gay people and transgender people. And it leaves us with a tough question this morning. It's this, how can we? because I can't do this alone, right? Like one message on a Sunday morning isn't gonna change everything. But if we have heart change, 
if we begin to have conversations and relationships, if we're willing to step into the uncomfortable, right, to be present with other people regardless of the perception, how can we at South Point create safe space for all people to know and to follow Jesus? To go at South Point when we get together, whether it's we're getting together digitally or whether we're getting together physically, whether we're getting together in small groups or on social media, that when we get together, that it's a safe space because our goal isn't to tell you how to behave. My goal is to point you to Jesus and to tell you the truth about Jesus and what surrender to Jesus looks like and to let you deal with Jesus and that. How do we create a safe people for people to know and to follow Jesus? I have a hope here at South Point. I have a hope, and here's my hope, in this season, and I think this season's a pretty crazy season, and you can just type amen in a thing, right? I think Jesus is the answer our world needs, right? And what if, what if those that claim to follow Jesus loved their neighbors, loved their coworkers, loved their fellow gym people, loved their neighbors, their waiters, uh, the, the baristas, loved everyone that they came in contact. If we loved everyone the way Christ did, and we did it so well and so deeply, that regardless of whether people agree with us, you know what we would be known for? Not that we are against people, that we as followers of Jesus would be known as for people, that we would love so compassionately, that we'd be so radically generous, that people go, I don't agree with all their beliefs, but the one thing that I know of them is that they are for people. And I wonder, doesn't everything change when it's someone you know? I want to close with a true story. Like I said, I have several very close friends who are both gay and have actually gone through the physical transgender process. And I can tell you a couple of truth statements today. One is, I've seen how painful and how challenging it has been for them. And not just in the world, because if we are really honest, the culture celebrates and accepts that. Their pain and their challenge hasn't been in culture. Most of their pain and challenge has been is that they love God, they want to go to church, they believe in Jesus, and they want to walk out their faith um, with authenticity. And if I could speak on behalf, what they've told me is they often feel like church is the most unsafe place for them. Can I let that sink in for a moment this morning? I have friends who love Jesus and they're going through this, this challenge from their perspective of telling me their pain. They love God. But church is not a safe place for them to show up. And I've seen them walk through that and they show up to church and they don't tell their friends and they try to hide it. And they can't have real conversations because some of the people that they go to church with will tell off-colored jokes and they'll make fun and they'll use slurs. And the church isn't a safe place for people who are gay or transgender to explore their faith and to explore what it means to follow Jesus. And I've seen their pain and I've seen their hurt. And I want, it matters to me that the reputation of Jesus isn't associated with hate and being against. I want the reputation of Jesus to be one that he died for all people and that your orientation and your gender does not disqualify you from the grace found in Jesus. I wonder, and I'd like to challenge all of us today, we don't have to compromise, and we don't have to condemn. You know what we can actually do? We can live in the messy middle, where we see all people as sacred, and we surrender ourselves to Jesus personally, and we're willing to step into uncomfortable relationships, regardless of the perception, to go that all people matter deeply to God. And because all people matter deeply to God, they matter to us. If you've stayed all the way to the end, I want to say thank you. And if you even showed up this Sunday, I want to say thanks for joining us through this, this very difficult but very real and needed series. Um, I hope that we can be a people who love our community so well that they will say good things about us and it will reflect well upon Jesus and people will be 
more in love with Christ because of the way that we loved our neighbors. Let me pray. God, I pray that anything that I said that wasn't from you will be immediately forgotten. God, I pray that only the things that come from you will be remembered and stuck in our hearts, God. God, I pray that we all have blind spots. We all have biases. We all have fears. We all have um, prejudices built into our heart and our soul through our culture and and through church and through uh, the world and through our lenses. God, I pray that you would allow us to see our friends who are gay or transgender as sacred people made in the image of God. Help us to love our neighbors, God. Help us to be a community of people that are so generous and so kind and so loving and so compassionate that we would be known as a group of people that is for the world and not against them. This is our hope and our prayer. In Jesus' name, and all who agreed said amen. God bless and have a great afternoon.